I do care what you do with this information because it is important to our survival as a species. It's important to our planet. It is important for the world. Okay, Dr. Becker, disability. This is taking three effectors every day and ProVigil. Uh, this is February 26, 2005, approximately 6.30 in the evening. And she's taking her effectors and everything like she's supposed to. This has been going on for about an hour and a half. She's stuck in a state of sleep paralysis. I've tried everything to get her out of it. I've been moving her arms, moving her legs, giving her something to drink, talking to her. She's stuck in it. Uh, this, this, we need something else. We need Zyram or something. This is your proof. This is what you need to see. You're seeing it. This isn't just today. This is about a two or three time week occurrence. Minimum. Sometimes it's every day. Alright. You can hear she's talk, trying to talk. She can't do it very well. She's probably telling me something to say on here. But as you can see, she's trying to talk, but her mouth and face can't even move. She's paralyzed. And sometimes she gets this combined with cataplexy. But like I said, she's been stuck in this for about an hour and a half now. Maybe a little longer. So this is a video of it. And this is a disability board watching it. How can someone work when they're stuck like this two or three times a week? No boss is ever going to do with it. See, you can hear her trying to talk. Obviously she can't. If she had this in the workplace, I'm pretty sure she'd be fired pretty quick. So please help us out. You should have everything you need. Thank you. My experience happened about 18 years ago. And it was in the middle of the night and I was asleep and my wife was next to me in the bed and all of a sudden I wake up extremely terrified and I hear in my head this really loud screeching sound and it just it was just horrible and it was terrifying and I went from asleep to this just almost instantly and I felt like my first impulse was to try and wake my wife up who was next to me so I tried to yell out I couldn't do that I felt like I was being pulled up out of the bed like to a sitting position something had a hold of me like right here pulling me up I didn't feel it was weird I didn't feel anything on me I just felt like something some force was pulling me up to this sitting position and after a few seconds I you know this noise the screeching and the being pulled up and the terror I just started to pray you know Lord Jesus please help me please help me and as soon as I organized those thoughts and started to pray the sound, the screeching sound, just died down to nothing. And then it felt like I fell back into the pillow. But we had a water bed, and I, after I felt like I fell back, I laid there trying to sense the bed moving. And I couldn't sense the bed moving. I don't think physically I was ever off the pillow, but it sure felt like I was being pulled up off the pillow. So, when I prayed, that ended it right there the minute I started calling on Jesus that ended it and I've never had an experience like that before or since that was really dramatic I you know it's something like that happens to you you don't forget it now I've had experiences later where I'll have like a terrifying dream and I'll start to pray and the dream will stop and you know that's happened several times but I've never had anything so physical like that and this this first thing that happened my heart was beating so fast it just felt like it was beating out of my chest and after I fell back into the pillow and after everything had stopped my heart was still beating really fast but the odd thing was it went right back to normal very quickly normally when you know for me when my heart's beating super fast like that it does, takes a while for it to go back down to normal this time it just went back slowly back into a normal rhythm so for me the key in all of this is was the prayer it, you just it's the faith and the relationship in Christ that makes the difference in this kind of situation because every time I've had an event similar to this prayer is what has ended it every single time 
And for me, that's that's been my experience, and I think that's the key to this whole thing. Paralysis is something that used to happen to me on a regular basis. Um, in my late teen years, I got so used to it that it almost became routine for me. And every time it happened, I would wake up hearing this strange blowing noise and would have no control over my body, except with the exception of my eyes. Like I could move my eyes, but my whole body was paralyzed. Um, in some rare cases, I wouldn't even be able to breathe as, so, as though something were trying to suffocate me. Almost instinctively, when this happened, I would call it the name Jesus, um, though I could sometimes barely even use my mouth. Um, but the more I would say his name, the more I would gain control over my body, and then the sleep paralysis would eventually cease. Um, there was this one instance where I woke up, unable to move, but I was able to turn my head uh, facing my door, the door in my room, and what I saw shocked me. Um, I'm not making this up, I saw a three foot tall pillar of black smoke float through my door all the way through my room and just uh, stood there next to my bed. And I sat there looking at it for a few seconds and then lost all consciousness. And the following day, I remembered the whole experience in vivid detail. Now, what's, what's noteworthy is that I had two grandparents who were into Freemasonry one of which committed suicide, <clears throat> um, and I'm convinced that the curses due to Masonic uh, ties have something to do with these, exp these experience I was having, uh, because it's only when I started to break off these generational curses um, through much prayer that I had victory over the sleep paralysis and it stopped altogether. It's been probably years since I've been attacked by one of these spirits, and not many people are aware of this, but the Masonic Oaths and Initiation Rites bring curses over yourself and your family members. So that's why it's always important to come against those curses in the name above all names, Yeshua Jesus. My experience with sleep paralysis began when I first became a Christian. Before I had experimented with various occultic practices, including chakric meditation and using sigils. It was not long after that I renounced all that stuff that I had my first attack. It would happen at night, when I'd wake up with the feeling of there being something pressing or sitting on me. Because I usually sleep on my side, it would be something that would be sitting on my head, sort of pressing me into the pillow. It felt like the weight of a small child that was getting increasingly heavier. Although sometimes I'd also w wake up to find myself on my back with something sitting on my chest. Although the experiences put me in an actual panic, I was able to realize what was going on despite the fog of my mind, and I was able to speak. I'd call on the name of Jesus for help, or if I couldn't speak, I'd just say the words in my head, and the attack would stop. I also had a visual experience once where, feeling a hand on my shoulder, I could, I could sort of see something lying behind me. Uh, that had sort of like a feminine figure. It was sort of bright yellow and had a longish face. Not really human looking. It wasn't. It wasn't very attractive, despite like the body shape. I don't know. It, it was like it was trying to seduce me, but it didn't work. I just ignored it. I went back to sleep. But then I'd wake up again later that night to have that familiar pressing feeling, which again dissipated when I called upon the Lord for help. Uh, these, these incidents were actually relatively mild compared to what would happen a few months later when I started sharing my faith with other people who I suspected had some kind of demonic oppression going on. The attacks would happen the very night I had talked to someone, whether in person, through the phone, or the internet, and they were a lot more violent than my previous experiences. Like, I'd feel like I was getting gripped or tossed and tumbled around my bed. I hear like really hateful whisperings in my ear and see visions of, of weird creepy things like gears and clockwork and, and my face reflected in a black jewel and just kind of weird things. And there were times when even pain was inflicted in some of these attacks. Although in each case, um, although 
I would still call upon the name of Jesus, it was still harder, because it was harder now, because uh, not only was my mouth unable to open, but my mind was just so clouded, it made it really hard to focus. Um, eventually, I'd be able to mouth, like, simple words, or, or I'd just start humming the tune, do the song, you know, Jesus loves me, this I know, which is, uh, which I know from my childhood. Um, the attacks would stop, but for a time they did make me more hesitant to step out and talk to, about Jesus to these individuals, though I, I didn't stop entirely, became less frequent. After a number of months going through this, um, and the violence of the attacks didn't seem to secede, I prayed to God that unless he could get something more for me to learn from these attacks, if he could just stop them and just protect me from them from now on before they began, that'd be great. <laughs> so since that day, I haven't had a single attack regardless of where I stick my neck. Um, so despite like the experience, I can say that I'm grateful for what I went through, as it's made me more aware of the spiritual aspect of the Christian battle, as well as where specific bastions of demonic power reside in the people and, and places around me. Although I wasn't really terribly steeped in the occult, it was enough. It was enough to have the door left open that made me vulnerable not only to the smaller demons who had attached themselves to me, but also to the stronger ones that come from other places. Um, but regardless of their intensity, they, they all fall before the name and person of Jesus Christ. So if you're, if you're having sleep paralysis, I urge you to trust in Jesus to deliver you, not only on a nightly basis, but to make him the Lord of your life. Because not all incidents of sleep paralysis will be scary, but it's deceptive, because like despite appearances, their purpose is to drag you right into the pit of hell. But no matter what, their hatred of you can't compare to the love of God for you, who gave his only son Jesus, that you may enjoy eternal fellowship with him. And that can start right here on earth with freedom from demonic oppression. Thank you. Modern Western medical thought says that sleep paralysis occurs when the brain awakes from the REM state, but the body is still in a state of paralysis, which they say prevents the body from manifesting movements made in the subject's dreams and thus causes hallucinations, mostly of, quote, evil presences in the room. Yet they freely admit that very little is known about the physiology of sleep paralysis, and that this is at best a guess. There are several problems with this theory. One is that if it is generally accompanied by the sense that there is something evil in the room, and if it were only the result of people dreaming, even though their body is still asleep, why isn't there more people reporting all kinds of very different dreams, as you would expect, as opposed to almost identical experiences with this evil presence? The same story, the same feeling, and sometimes the same entity are being described by people who have had no contact with one another, or who have ever heard of sleep paralysis before. I think it is helpful at this point to hear what other cultures have believed about sleep paralysis for hundreds of years. In the Persian culture, it's a quote, ghost-like creature that causes sleep paralysis. In the Malaysian culture, they are reported as demonic figures. In Tamil and Sri Lanka, the translation of the term is a ghost that forces one down. In the Muslim culture, it's jinns or demons. In the Ethiopian culture, some form of evil spirit. In Zimbabwe and Shona culture, some spirit, especially an evil one. In Greece and Cyprus, it's a ghost-like creature or demon. In the southwest Nigeria region, it's a demon. In Maltese folk culture, sleep paralysis is attributed to ghosts. In Iceland folk culture, it's a goblin or succubus. In Chinese culture, it's literally translated as a ghost pressing on body, and similarly, in the Vietnamese culture, it's translated as held down by a ghost, also in Hmong culture, translated as crushing demon. In Cambodian, Laotian, and Thai culture, it's attributed to ghosts. It may be tempting to dismiss these cultures' views about sleep paralysis, because we think that our culture has grown out of a belief of demons. But if you have been experiencing sleep paralysis in your life, you know that the demon explanation shouldn't be thrown out quite so fast, regardless of what you think that you know about how the world works. I'm going to shoot straight with you. I know what sleep paralysis is, and I know how to stop it, and I've seen tons of people beat it for good. So bear with me as I explain all this, because I'm sure many of you will not like the truth about this, 
But this will be all the information that you will need to terminate sleep paralysis for good in your life. You may have guessed by now that sleep paralysis is caused by demonic presence in the room. There is some good news and bad news about this. The bad news is, is that demons are smart and deceptive and very evil. The good news is that there is a way to turn the tables on them and to make them the victims of your next encounter, as well as end it for good. If you have been researching possible causes of sleep paralysis from a Western medical perspective, you have found that everyone seems to be guessing and that no two answers are alike. I will tell you from my experience what the real causes of sleep paralysis are. I will list a few of the common causes. The most common that I have dealt with is people that have in some way been involved with on various levels, even very light level, occult practices such as the Ouija board, tarot cards, certain types of meditation, channeling, even obsessive research about the occult or UFOs can be the cause for some people. Generally, the deeper the person goes into the occult, the more, quote, doors that they open, and the more authority the demons gain over them, which can lead to severe physical attacks and even abductions. It is important to realize that the demons gain more authority over you the deeper you go. That is why that they have an interest in a person becoming more active in the occult. Another cause is some form of generational door that has been opened for the person usually by a parent or grandparent, most often when a grandfather has been involved in high-level Masonic or other rituals. This can also happen if the parents or grandparents were involved with the occult on a pretty heavy level. This is usually the issue with people who have had sleep paralysis since they were very young. Another, more rare possibility is that there is a highly demonized object in the room. I know this sounds weird, but objects can be given demonic, quote, attachment in certain rituals. This can be crystals, books, or statues, Really just about anything can be demonized. Even if the person that is attaching the demonic presence thinks that they are only attaching, quote, energy or something else. As I have said, it is more rare, but it is still possible. There are a few other very rare possibilities, but I am already sounding crazy enough as it is, and I'm running out of time. So if you don't fall into any of these categories, email us at help at stopsleepparalysis.org and we will help you. Sleep paralysis is often tied to astral projection, or leaving your body, because they are done in the same way, that is through the help of demonic presence. Even though the people that are usually doing it are deceived into thinking that they are doing it on their own. But that is why it is so easy to leave your body during these episodes, because the source of the ability is in the room with you. You will find that many people tell others to embrace this ability when they are having sleep paralysis episodes. Please don't listen to them. This is extremely unwise and will cause more and more severe sleep paralysis episodes down the line. The short answer to how these experiences are stopped is through the authority of the real Jesus Christ. The doubts that you may have about this will vanish as soon as you see the reaction of the demons to this authority. The mechanics of this start with Jesus himself. In Luke 9 verse 1 it says, Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons. And in 1 John 3, verse 8, it says, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. And again in Luke 10, verses 19 through 20, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Jesus says he has given this authority to us, that is to Christians, but calling out for Jesus' help will stop the individual sleep paralysis experience, even if the person is not a Christian, as long as the person is calling out in sincerity and not using it as a magic word. In fact, the Bible warns specifically about doing this very thing. In Acts 19 there were some people that saw that the apostles of Jesus had been given this authority over the demonic realm, and they tried to use it for themselves even though they didn't believe. It says, In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. The seven sons of Shiva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them and said, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? And the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. So be careful if you're not a Christian and using the authority of Christ. Make sure that you are calling on the real Christ in sincerity for his help. 
Sometimes, during sleep paralysis, it is difficult to call out with your mouth or to think of the words to say, but even if you can only think of one word, let it be calling out on the name of Jesus for help. If you cannot use your mouth, ask God to give you the use of your mouth. I have even heard of a woman spelling out with her pinky finger the name of Jesus and stopped the experience. If you are not a Christian, even though you may have won the battle by calling out for Jesus' help and sincerity, they will keep coming back, as they still have authority over you, because either you or someone else has given it to them. They will continue to have this until you renounce them and give your life to Jesus, who will not only set you free of this kind of bondage, but will give you a new power to love Him and to love truth, and to have total peace and joy. This is what you must do to end sleep paralysis for good in your life. Number one, recognize. You must recognize what it is. Demons. Number two, responsibility. You must take responsibility for what you recognize. Number three, repent. Repent to God for participating with what you recognize. It says in the Bible, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. The Bible also says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Number four, renounce. You must make what you recognize, your enemy, and renounce it. This is especially important if there is a generational sin that is going on. Renounce anything that has been done by anyone in your family, and ask Jesus to help close those doors. He is faithful to do so. Number five, remove it. Get rid of it once and for all. You must close the doors. Don't leave the doors half open. Close and lock them and throw away the key. Number six, resist. When it tries to come back, resist it. You must be bold if they come back. I have heard of someone's last experience with them being when they decided to start commanding them to go to the quote abyss with the authority of Christ. Show no mercy on them. They must obey the authority of Christ. Number seven, rejoice. Give Jesus thanks for setting you free. And number eight, restore. Help someone else to get free. The bottom line is to give your life to Jesus and to let him give you his strength to become what you can't be without him. He will change you from the inside out and give you the power to become more like him, which will set you free. It is of the utmost importance to know who the real Jesus is. In this 20 minute video that we have made, we will explain something that many modern day Christians are only beginning to remember. Please go to dvdtract.com. That's dvdtract.com. Thanks for your time. Nowhere to run radio on my experience with sleep paralysis and how I got it to stop. I've done shows on this. Um, you can go to blogtalkradio.com slash antimatterzone. Or my YouTube channel, you can type in blackhelicopterradio.com and that'll take you to my YouTube channel. Um, people who have listened to the show know this about me, but I've never just made it in a concise and easy format. So here it is. This is for you, Chris White, and a tribute to your website, Stop Sleep Paralysis, and the, the video work you did on it. All right. Just a little background story. Um, I was raised in the Mormon faith. I fell away from that when I was around 14 and 15, stopped going to church. Went from that to s sort of calling myself a Christian to then just going downhill and calling myself an atheist. Um, as a teenager, I basically uh, just became very nihilistic and uh, depressed and into just, you know, thinking that life is meaningless and. Because, you know, I just had so many things within me shattered. But um, from there, I started getting into some very dark music. I mean, really satanic heavy metal. Not just Ozzy Osbourne and Judas Priest and that kind of mainstream stuff. I'm talking about black metal, death metal, stuff that is literally meant to conjure up spirits. And I mean, and some of these bands are very serious. It's not all just shocking and rebellious and you know some some people say they use ace or uh, s satanic imagery as a way to espouse their atheism no some of these bands are literal literal occultists really into the occult the black magic whatever you want to call it um and 
If you don't believe me, just look up the Norwegian black metal scene and the series of murders and church burnings that went on then. I got really into that. Okay, eventually I, m I went to college and I had a roommate and just mysteriously I get a roommate who is also into heavy metal, black metal, death metal, extreme metal, and who himself was an occultist. Okay, this is when my sleep paralysis first really started. I did have a few episodes before that as a young teenager. This is around the time when I was 18 and 19. When I was a teenager, I did have a few minor instances with sleep paralysis, but it really started then and started becoming more and more intense. Um, I cannot tell you the reality that sleep paralysis is absolutely demonic spiritual warfare from my own personal experience. I know by now many of you are probably familiar with what sleep paralysis is, but for those of you who aren't, I will go into a brief description. Um, usually it happens when you're either waking from sleeping or falling asleep, and you're paralyzed, you can't move, your eyes work, you can see, um, but you literally cannot move, you cannot cry out, and it varies in degrees of intensity. And I've noticed a common pattern is that it starts out not so intense, just you know, kind of upsetting and frightening, but it gets progressively more and more intense. And that was at least my case, and I've seen other people with similar cases. So it starts out, you're just confused, you don't know why you can't move, you're kind of freaking out. But it goes from that to eventually having entities um, literally attacking you, um, literally feeling like you're being sucked down into the earth, uh, into hell. I, um, so yeah, 19 it started. Um, from there though, I eventually left that college and uh, it kind of simmered down for a while. But just recently, a few years, like two years ago, it started back up again. And what I was doing, I was getting really into uh, UFO and abduction studies, reading them like crazy. And um, also, I was getting into some Eastern practices, trying to awaken my third eye, getting into some intense uh, meditation practices, um, just some kind of, you know, new age, which uh, stuff that I think is absolute garbage now, and I have good reason for that. And it all kind of started back up. I literally thought I was losing my mind at one point. It would happen so frequently, and each time become more and more intense, that I had to try to figure out a way to stop it. So just a few instances of what happened um, to give you an idea of how absolutely frightening this is. Um, I would wake up, I would have this intense, you have this intense feeling of fear, and you've had this intense, it's hard to describe, but this intense feeling of evil in your surrounding area. But eventually, like I said, it went from just f sensing that evil to actually seeing demonic presences in the area. Seeing, sometimes it'd be a, a shadow figure, very hard to make out. Um, sometimes it'd look like a very slim, almost alien-like figure. Um, I remember one time seeing it coming through my door in the absolute utmost fear you could ever imagine. Uh, from there, I had a, one experience where I woke up, and I had this was the worst I would say it ever got was one time I had these uh, demonic-looking hands with claws on them, feeling like they're ripping you down, the pressure on your chest, pulling you through the bed. It was just hellish, and I didn't know what it was. I thought I was either losing my mind or I was having the beginning of some t sort of alien abduction type experience. It wasn't until I started looking into sleep paralysis and saw all of the people who had it as well that uh, I didn't feel so crazy. It actually was, a, in a strange way, a kind of relief to me. And then it wasn't until I stumbled upon Chris White's work on sleep paralysis and then also the website stopsleepparalysis.org that sure enough I was able to get it to stop. Um, there's countless others like me with this testimony that the name of Christ or I, I use the name Yeshua just uh, in Yahweh personally that's that's my that's just what I do it does make it stop I've had little to no I've had very very few instances with it and when I do I can usually get it to stop pretty quick it, this shows the literal soup literally the supernatural power of the name of this of this uh the true God you know, and um, you know what, I, I was kind of hesitant to put this video out here right now, to be honest, because I still have a little bit of embarrassment, people thinking I'm crazy, but at this point I just don't care, and for me to not put it out I think would actually be much worse, because I think it's important for us to have the fear 
of the high of of you know God and us, not the fear of man. You know, so you can laugh, you can scoff at me, you can tell me I'm crazy, you can say I'm deluded, you can say whatever you want, but it changed me forever. And for me to deny the power uh, and and how that sh was shown to me that that is the true God to stop this spiritual demonic warfare against me personally, um, forever changed me. And unfortunately, I don't know. You know, I can only say so much. And you, you have it's up to you to decide if you want to believe me, but I'm just telling you the truth from my perspective. I've got nothing to really gain from this, you know. Um, in fact, I'd say that more more to lose, and people tend to look down on stories like this. And uh, so I just uh, Chris posted a a uh, Facebook post asking people to share their stories. So I've been wanting to do this for a long time, anyways. But I really want to thank Chris White for putting that information out there. Literally. Um, not jokingly, the, the implications of it are huge as far as salvation and being saved by the true God, Yahweh, Yeshua. So that is my uh, story of sleep paralysis. Thank you all for listening, and uh, I will talk to you later. My experience with sleep paralysis, um, I had five in all, five events in all, hopefully no more. Um, why it happened, there's possible reasons. Um, my mom had admitted that she had prayed to Satan at one point in her life, which really shocked me. Um, I like ghost hunting videos and ghost stories, and maybe that let it in. But anyway, I had the five events, and the first one, there was a whitish blue figure that was kind of glowing and raising up from the side of my bed. It felt pure evil. It was pure evil. Um, I had the typical where you can't move, but I didn't feel a weight or a pressure on my chest, not with any of these. I just had the terrifying evil, presence of evil, and I was saying, in the name of Jesus, leave, in the name of Jesus, leave, and it was very, very hard to say, but after several attempts, it did leave. This this left me shocked. I've never had anything like this in my entire life, and I'm 45 years old. Nothing like this has ever happened. And then, to my surprise, I had a second one, and in this one, it was a black mass, and it came from the door, it rose up above me, and just hovered over me. Again, I didn't feel like it was on my chest. I just felt evil, just evil that wanted to drag you to the pits of hell evil. And it's massive, just hovering, and again, I was saying, in the name of Jesus, leave, in the name of Jesus, leave. And it was even harder this time and took way more attempts to get it to go. And it did. The third one was the worst. And it has left me still terrified. I sleep with the lights on. If it storms, I sleep with a flashlight in my hand. Um, this time, the, the presence came into the room again. It was a big, massive shape. Just, uh, I don't know how to explain it. Just a form, a big massive form, and this is hard for me to tell you, but in this one it grabbed my thigh very hard, I could feel pain, and um, it attempted to rape me. Um, I could feel the presence of him, it was definitely a man, evil man thing, but that sounds horrible, between my legs, and it spoke. It said, um, he cannot protect you. And this is the first time I spoke. This was the worst experience of all. Um, again, I said, in the name of Jesus, be gone. In the name of Jesus, leave. And this was the hardest one to get it to go. And it did. And I'm just, I'm still shook up. It was just terrifying. Then the fourth one, I got angry. I was done with this. And it came back, the same big massive presence, and I said, you need to go in the name of Jesus. I am a child of God. You cannot do this to me. It left in like 10 seconds. It was gone. And there was only one more after that that maybe lasted five seconds. The presence came into the room. I'm still angry. I'm done being terrified. I'm mad. And I said, you will leave in the name of Jesus. And boom, it was gone. I haven't had any sense. I hope I never do again, and I pray to Jesus every night, please make it go away, and keep, please keep it away. So, um, I am a strong believer this was real, it was a spiritual attack, and Jesus saved me. I prayed, and Jesus answered me, and so far nothing, so this is my experience, 
it's very real. It's very real. Don't let anyone tell you different. Pure evil. But Jesus can save you from it. That's my story. Thank you. Hey everybody, my name is Chris White, and I'm with StopSleepParalysis.org. I thought I would do this audio to kind of give the long version of what I would say to someone that wrote into the website that was having sleep paralysis and wanted to know how to stop it. Because over the years, I've talked to probably hundreds of people with sleep paralysis in varying degrees, some of them very severe, some of them kind of mild, and what I say to them in terms of how to stop sleep paralysis is pretty much the same. So I thought I could do an audio that was kind of geared for the person with the most severe case of sleep paralysis. And by doing so, I would essentially be helping all the kinds of people that would write in. Because, as I said, the answers to just about everybody are the same. What I would suggest, if one was looking to learn a lot more about what I'm about to refer to as doors, that is, opening doors in your life to these demonic beings to understand how that functions, why it is that certain occult practices and other things like that are opening doors, I would refer you to a few different places. One of them is a video called Demystifying the Occult. It goes through a very basic understanding of how things like occult practices open up doors to the demonic realm. Basically, they are desiring to have more access to you, but they can't get that access to you unless you essentially give it away to them. And so they have kind of enticed us with a lot of different methods that kind of break down the natural protection we have against them. And as we continue to do those things that break down that barrier, they continue to have more access to them, to us rather. So that's why it tends to get more severe down the line if the person is still doing whatever it is that's opening these doors. So if you'd like to learn more about how that functions, you can see that movie, Demystifying the Occult. Also on the website, there is another shorter video called How to Stop Sleep Paralysis, which is sort of the short version of what I'm about to do here, which is explain exactly how to stop it and what you can do to be free from this forever. So I would also recommend it Stop Sleep Paralysis. There's lots of written testimonies. There's video testimonies. And also, if you are wondering what kind of things that may have been done to open up those doors in your life, and you have no idea what it could be, a good place to check is uh, another website that we run called sleepsurvey.org. That's sleepsurvey.org. You don't necessarily have to take the survey, but you can scroll down and see the kind of boxes that are there that you can check. And you can get an idea of the kinds of things that are generally associated with sleep paralysis. So that's all good to know exactly what it is that has happened. But a lot of times people will write in and say, you know, I've checked all that stuff and I can't find a single thing that would explain why this is happening. You know, they, they haven't been involved in the occult. You know, their parents and grandparents weren't involved in the occult or something like that. And they're just stumped, you know, what could it be? And for that person, this will also work for you because what I've found over the years is it doesn't really matter if we ever get to the bottom of it in a case like that because the how to stop it is the same. The only thing that I would say to somebody, it, it is important to know what it is that's causing the open doors if it's an obvious thing that you're doing in your life, if you're practicing some occult practice or doing some or taking some particular drug or whatever, that you, you need to know what that is because you need to stop doing it as a part of this process because you don't want to continue to open up those doors. You can't, as we're going to find out, just by stopping the thing in your life, we'll just call it what it is, the sin in your life, it's not going to make this stop forever. The way this works is the protection that you naturally have against these beings is kind of being chipped away. Those chips are permanent. You can't repair it yourself. They can be repaired. I want to let you know that this protection can be prepared, excuse me, repaired, but it's not going to be repaired just by stopping it. What you're going to do by stopping whatever it is that's being done 
is you're going to prevent it from getting any worse. And it will get worse if you continue to do this. In the cases of generational doorways, that is something that was opened by their parents or grandparents, usually in some kind of ritual or something, whether the, the parent or grandparent actually knew what they were doing or not, they were giving away their ownership of the child to the dark side, if you will, to the enemy. And it's not necessarily their fault in a lot of cases. They thought they were probably doing something good or whatever, but that's how this dark side operates. It tricks people into thinking what they're doing is good. But nevertheless, my point is that those doors tend to be pretty much the same, that they're going to stay the same level throughout the person's life unless the person opens up more doors as a result of that. Usually what happens, or what happens a lot of times, is that the person that has generational doors has been experiencing this since they were very young, or sometimes they'll say as far as they can remember, they've been having these supernatural experiences. And what they will interpret that as, and I would say they're encouraged to interpret it this way, is that it's because they are naturally, quote unquote, gifted or psychic or, you know, whatever. The, The person may be thinking that they are you know, any number of things that makes them special. And that's an interesting idea because it makes the person want to go in further. Okay, now I'm super special, so I want to go look into this more. I want to be use this gift that I have. And so then they will open up the doors wider because now it's them opening the doors. They're trying to look into occult things and they because they think that they have a particular talent for it. So a lot of times... What I'm I'm trying to say is that the doorways are not going to get any worse unless, in a generational case, unless you begin to open them yourself through the the same practices that other people make them worse about. Okay, so that was a little confusing. Okay, so let's move on to, first of all, you can stop the individual attacks even if you're not a Christian. If I haven't mentioned this before, the only way to stop this for good, the only hope that we have in this is the real... Jesus Christ, Jesus of the Bible. He's the only thing in the world that these beings are afraid of, and they are more than a little afraid of him. They are terrified of him. They shake, they tremble, they know that he has the authority to destroy them, and that he ultimately will destroy them. They are extremely conscious of this fact. You can see this in the Bible as well. Mark uh, is a great book of the Bible. The first chapter talks about Jesus casts a demon out of a person that says, you know, have you come to destroy us before our appointed time? That's what the demonic voice is saying. And later on in, in Mark chapter 5, we see that these beings are again terrified of him. They beg him, don't send us to the abyss, which is an important concept that we'll talk about later. But my point is, is that Jesus is our only hope in this, not just to scare these beings or to make them stop what they're doing, but also because he is the only way to essentially repair these doors. We can stop doing whatever we're doing, but it's not going to repair the doors, the protection barrier that we've destroyed or are slowly destroying. That's not going to just get better if you leave it alone. But he has the power to also restore that. And that is through an actual, real, supernatural Christianity. And I say it that way because a lot of people think Christianity is just sort of rules that you follow. But Christianity is a supernatural thing that happens to a person that changes their heart. It's no longer a chore to want to do good and to begin to hate evil. Because it says that if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away, all things become new. And that was something that happened in my life. It was something that I wasn't expecting. I thought Christianity was a bunch of rules. But when I really decided, okay, if Jesus is Lord, if he really says, like in the the Bible, it says, all power has been given to me, you know, in heaven and earth. If he is really Lord then I'm going to make him number one in my life, in my heart anyway. I'm going to say that he's more important than all this other stuff. And it's that one little idea that changes everything. The idea that you will say, okay, I'm not the boss anymore, he's the boss. If I could just simplify what repentance is, that's it. It's the idea that you're going to say, all right, if he's the boss, then he's the boss in your heart. And it's in that moment that, my life changed. I think what people call being born again or what Jesus calls being born again in in John chapter 3, that happened to me. And slowly, my heart started to change. And I wanted 
good things and all these addictions and terrible things that I was doing were slowly just falling off me. I even tried to continue to do them, but I couldn't do them because I had a new heart. Just like Ezekiel says that in the new covenant, there would be a new heart for people. They would no longer have a heart of stone, but a heart of flesh. So anyway, didn't want to preach to you. I want to try to help you here. Uh, but, but unfortunately, or fortunately, whatever way you look at it, the only way to really to stop this for good is through Jesus Christ. So continuing, so the individual experiences, you can, you don't have to be a Christian to stop the individual experiences. So what I mean is, though, Jesus has given us authority over demonic spirits. Luke 10 is a good example of this, uh, where he says that, you know, all the spirits are subject unto you. They must do what you say in my name. So that's for Christians, that particular thing, as far as ordering them around, sending them to the abyss, those types of things. That's that's only something that Christians can do. But what non-Christians can do is they can call on Jesus for help, you know, asking him, please help me in this scenario. And he will. And especially, this is really important for those people that have been experiencing this for a long time. They're very used to what it's like when these beings are doing what they're doing, especially in severe cases, perhaps if there's anything sexual going on or whatever. Somebody that has dealt with this for a long time, that person will begin to know something is different if they genuinely call in sincerity for, for Jesus to help them in that scenario. And he will. And it's it's that person that will then see, okay, that was different. You know, something different is happening. These beings that I'm so used to are now afraid of this power that's stronger, bigger, more obviously good than them. So that's an important first step is knowing that this is true, that they really are afraid of Jesus Christ. But that won't help you if you continue to say, okay, well, I'm not going to become a Christian, but I'm just going to use this for every uh, time that they attack. And that, you know, I would encourage you to continue to do that. I'm not, I'm not telling you when to become a Christian and when not to or whatever, but and that's okay to continue to do that. But know that it's not going to it's not going to stop this for good. You're going to continue to deal with this all the time. And they're going to keep coming back and they're going to keep getting more nasty. So that's one thing I wanted to explain. I kind of have explained it this way in the past. Sometimes it helps to visualize this. I explain our our lives and our protection against these beings like shares in a company, like stock, like, you know, people trade stocks in a company. And imagine your life is a certain number of shares. And all throughout the course of your life, you kind of get tricked into selling shares to Satan. Like, okay, so he says, okay, why don't you do this Ouija board at this party, you know? And he, he tricks you into giving, you know, maybe two, three shares to him just a little bit of hole in your natural protection against against him. You've sold him three shares. And if you do something else, you know, later on, you know, I did this, you know, give him a few shares here. And just through the course of time, he eventually accumulates a good deal of right or authority in your life. He now has lots of uh, of authority in your life to do lots of different things if you if you do major things if you're if you're a you know a severe cult practitioner and you're doing all kinds of stuff he has tons of authority in your life and can do with you a lot of things that's why sleep paralysis keeps getting worse and worse and worse as you continue to do it now the problem is is that you can't get, ever get those shares back from him and just start over you can't yourself take the shares away from his hand and repair that protection that you naturally had. It's done. The only thing that you can do, and I'm saying this from experience of talking to people, trying to figure out what can be done. The only thing that you can do is you can actually take those shares from him and give them to Jesus. Essentially saying that, okay, my life I, I can't. I, I can give you my life. I can let you be my boss and let you be my lord. I, the more to the degree in which you say, "Look, I know I've been giving my life away and getting tricked to giving authority over my life away to the wrong side." But what you can do is you can go all the way the other direction and say, "Look, I'll give you my life to you. I will be your servant. I will be. You can be my boss." And in that moment, you can take those shares from him and give them all to a good and loving. Master, a person who loves you more than anybody else could possibly love you. It cares for you, knows everything about you, and wants what's best for you. It's just a no-brainer 
that it's kind of like if you could imagine a really good and just king, you know, somebody that was totally worthy of your obedience. Now, that doesn't mean that, okay, now we're going to start following a bunch of rules. The good thing about him is what he says is, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come to me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your souls. He has, he's rest, he's peace. And he doesn't, you know, what he wants in terms of obedience is just that one thing, is is a heart level change to say, I just want I want you. I, I can't do it. I have all these problems. I have all these things that I'm addicted to and so on. But he will help you with that. Uh, and it's not an overnight process. It's so, sometimes it is an overnight process. There were a lot of things that, uh, when that happened to me, were just gone like that. But there were other things that uh, I was being worked on for a long time. Still are, still am being worked on. That's the beauty of this thing, is that it's a it's a lifelong process. This, what the theological term, term for it is sanctification. It's something that God does in you. But anyway, so that's one thing. You can stop it, the individual experiences, but to stop it for good, you have to take those shares away and give them to one that is worthy of having them. Now, there's other things like renouncing family ties and things like that. A lot of people put a lot of importance on that, and I think it's an important thing to do is to say, you know, I don't, if in terms of generational stuff, or if it's something that you did and you know what it was, occult stuff or whatever, especially occult stuff and things like that, you need to say, look, I, I know I've opened these doors and I want to renounce all that. I don't want anything to do with that stuff anymore. If it's something that, you know, happened in your family or whatever, you can say, I don't, I don't want any of that. Whatever they did, I don't want a part of that. I forgive everybody involved. You know, I know that they were just deceived. I know that I was just deceived. I want to renounce it. And I think that's an important thing to do. You know, a lot of this in terms of the repairing of the doors to its uh, natural state is in that is a state of protection against these demonic beings is in a personal conversation with Jesus Christ. It's a really real conversation that you have continually, not just once or twice, but he wants you to come to him and talk to him like he is a friend, a father, somebody that cares deeply about you and is delighted to hear from you. That's the thing that the Bible says about God and and, and us, that he delights like any father would if they're, you know, even, I don't know if you have, you know, you text your parents or something and they're just so excited, you know, to hear from you. Well, he's like that with you too. And he wants you to be real with him as well. I mean, he knows everything anyway, so there's no there's no sense in beating around the bush with him. It's just talk to him about what's on your heart about this stuff. It's good to go to him and ask and bring these doors up and say, you know, I want to solidify this protection. I want to just it's a continual conversation with him about these doors being repaired. That's a good way to look at it in terms of a continual prayer life. We're going to talk a little bit later about the going on the offense. It's an important part of this too because you can make your name renowned in hell, and you can make these demons afraid of you if now you are a part of his family. Because now you're a prince to the most powerful, the king of all kings, the name above all names. They, you have some armor on now, and they are really, really afraid that a person like that will ever understand the power that has been given to them. If you are a Christian, and you know that you're a Christian... It may come as a surprise to you that you have this kind of authority, and I think it shouldn't be a surprise that this kind of thing has been intentionally kept from us in a lot of ways. It's not really emphasized very much, but it's as clear as day from the Scripture that Jesus didn't want these things to be able to bother us. I don't mean to say that if you're experiencing some some of this that it's you know that you there's something wrong with you. No, Jesus knew that it was going to happen. He knew these things would try. But that's why he gave us the authority to send them to the abyss, to rebuke them in the name and authority of Jesus Christ. If you continually do that kind of stuff, for example, I mentioned the abyss a few times. Let me talk about that. In Mark chapter 5, they begged Jesus not to go to the abyss. In another place, Jesus describes the place where they go when they leave a person uh, as dry places. I don't really know. I haven't really done a study as to what that means. But I would say that the alternative for them is terrible particularly the abyss. We know from Scripture that the abyss is kind of like a prison. And so in Mark chapter 5 there, they were asking not to go to this prison. We can kind of infer that it's kind of like game over for them. It's kind of like they're locked there 
until a particular moment in uh, the end times in Revelation, the fifth trumpet, I believe, where, where it's opened for five months, and it's another story. But they are locked in there until then. It's kind of like a player leaves the field for Satan. That's a bad deal for Satan. If, if he's sending people, try to think of it like a, a business or a military from Satan's perspective. He sees you, he sees you have, uh, your protection is down, and for all the various reasons, particularly just because he hates you, he will assign certain ones to you to do this, the sleep paralysis or whatever it is that they're doing, and if he knows that you are the type of person that is now sending whatever comes your way to the abyss, in the name of Jesus Christ, it commands you to go to the abyss and never return. You know, whatever, whatever it is, if you're that kind of person and you're just, you're dead set on that, you're, you are angry about this now and you're going on the offensive. That becomes a problem for his team because he's, lo he's losing players by sending them to you because you are now being on the offensive. He will do everything he can to keep you from being that bold. Sometimes what happens for new Christians and people just doing this for the first time is what I call trying to punk you out. They may try to try to act like it doesn't bother them or some kind of counterattack will happen at first. You have to consider this is Satan's last hurrah, his last shot at getting you to crawl back in your shell with this because he knows that it's like a Hail Mary at the end of a game. It's his last chance to try to get you to crawl back in to not use that authority. Because if you go on the offensive like that, if you are a Christian and you know you have authority, then he is busted. It's over for him. Another thing that's important is that in addition to going on the offensive in terms of spiritual warfare, and there's a lot of good material on that I can um, send you. I'd be happy to send you what I've been calling the Christianity 101 DVDs from my uh, website, Chris White Ministries. I think I'll try to put one on the uh, sleep paralysis site here as well, where you can order one of these things. There are about eight gigabytes of audio and video and just lots of things that I think are helpful. And it has some information there about, about this issue as well, so that is spiritual warfare. There's another audio that's online from uh, one of my favorite guys named Russ Dizdar. He is a very good guy. He did an audio called How to Get Yourself and Others Free from Dark Spirits, I think is the name of it. How to Get Yourself and Others Free from Dark Spirits. And he basically just prays for you to sort of explain some issues that are important for somebody that may be dealing with this. And I highly recommend that audio as well. But what I wanted to say is that in addition to spiritual warfare, it's an attitude of prayer, especially, you know, at night, you know, before you go to bed. And, you know, preemptively praying against this stuff, you know, asking Jesus to help you before, you, you know, if any spirits come, you know, to be with you at night and to protect you against them and, and pray during the day or whatever. It's an attitude of prayer. It's a glorious and wonderful thing that happens. And finally, I want to mention this. There are a lot of things out there, especially people that have come from the New Age or the occult, uh, like I did. I believed a lot of things untrue things about the Bible, about Jesus as a historical person. I had all kinds of ideas that I thought proved that, you know, Jesus wasn't real. I certainly didn't need to follow him and the Bible wasn't this and that. I all kinds of ideas that I was so sure about. But the interesting thing about all those things is they kind of require you not to look into it for yourself. It requires you to simply believe it on faith. You know, you saw a movie on YouTube that said Jesus didn't exist or whatever, and you say, well, I would prefer that to be true, because if that's true, then I don't have any accountability for my actions. I can do whatever I want. I can be my own boss. And, and, and that's attractive of an idea. So it, it's not something that you want to look into. But if that's you right now, if you're saying, well, you know, I, I believe all this stuff. I can't possibly believe what you're saying or believe that Jesus is you know, worthy of my following him because I don't believe he existed or all these other things. You need to deal with that stuff first. And the good thing about it is that the truth is on his side. You know, he said he is the truth. And it's true. If you really want to find what is factually true, that road will end right at Jesus Christ every time. He is the end of the road. If you're really diligent about seeking the truth, I want you to be that kind of person from now on. Now it's important that you find the truth. If what I'm saying is true and that these are demons and that you are in great danger and that the only way to stop this is through Jesus Christ, if that's true, you need to know that it's true. 
So I would encourage you, I'm going to put on the site, stopsleepparalysis.org, a section called Apologetics. And it's going to be a lot of different videos that answer a lot of the common questions. It's something that I've been doing for a lo long time, doing videos about these kinds of questions, since I personally used to believe a lot of this stuff as well. So that's an important aspect as well. If anybody has any questions for me, you can email me. My email address is chris, C-H-R-I-S, at chriswhiteministries.com. Okay, hope this helps. Bye-bye. Now that we have covered what sleep paralysis is and how to stop it, I wanted to bring up astral projections. Now astral projections is a new age belief and according to the new age, your spirit guide will help you when laying in bed to do this astral projection. According to the new age, astral projection is a practice that allows one to leave their body and to fly around the earth at will. Now, I do not doubt the possibility of this. I have heard many testimonies of people doing this. But what interested me is the connection it has to sleep paralysis. While I was researching sleep paralysis, I noticed it has many connections to astral projection, and the experiences are also very similar. While doing research, I found this comment on a forum. Quote, When you actively try to astral project, sleep paralysis is a very common experience. Fortunately, I had been taking classes and knew to expect this. It would have been frightening otherwise. Now, I actually look forward to the sleep paralysis. It's not always easy to know when the split has occurred. Otherwise, sometimes I have, have remained lying down trying to project, when in fact I was already awake in the astral and could have gotten my astral body up. End quote. So this person is saying that when one intentionally tries to astral project, sleep paralysis will happen. Now, don't you think that is pretty odd that we have testimony of people who suffered from sleep paralysis saying that they were being lifted up by a powerful spiritual force? So we have the Bible telling us to stay away from these demons and witchcraft, and we have another group of people saying to accept these demons as your spirit guide. This is indeed a spiritual war.